So good day and welcome back to the channel. A couple of weeks ago, I saw something called Rapture Anxiety and I decided that I'm going to do a short video about what I saw. It was a CNN article about some guy, I think he was a an ex-pastor or something like that and he was stating that a lot of people are suffering including himself from rapture anxiety and and the, the the church and Christianity is causing people mental trauma and all this sort of stuff and the word rapture doesn't even exist in the Bible so I decided to do a short video on this to deal with rapture anxiety or whatever the heck that is and to deal with if the rapture is mentioned in the bible and etc and all those claims that he was making as well as rapture anxiety caused by whatever i think the left behind movie series or whatever is being taught but first let's get into the rapture the concept of the rapture and the word now before we get into the concept he made a statement that the word rapture doesn't appear in the bible that is true and untrue the word rapture doesn't appear in the bible if you're reading it in english if you decide to read it in latin you're going to see the word rapture there all right uh, rapture and, and the concept of the rapture has been around since the beginning of the church all right he was also stating that the concept of the rapture doesn't exist in Catholic circles and that is true and it's true for a very simple reason the concept of the rapture is for Christ to come to redeem us and to save us from the evil empire the Catholic Church became the preeminent church in Christendom after in the in the, the fourth century AD after the, the conversion of Constantine or the supposed conversion of Constantine however that goes but prior to that all the early church fathers believed in a particular thing however you cannot expect or it's very reasonable that this new church that now has new powers and funding of the state and backing of the state to start to preach a doctrine that Christ is coming to save us from the evil empire you can't say that when the evil empire is paying your salary and when the evil empire is no longer torturing and killing you so that's put probably why it did not or it left the Catholic Church as a doctrine but let's look at the rapture and what the Bible says or at least some of what the Bible says about the rapture so in 1st Thessalonians 4 and reading from verse 15 we see this for this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep essentially who have died for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God take note the Lord will descend with a cry and with a trumpet then those then we who are alive who are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we will always be with the Lord now this passage the background for this is in the Thessalonian church the early church there started there was a rumor that was started that the rapture had happened and some people had missed it or you know christ had came and some people had missed it or um 
some of us will die and not get to the rapture. So Paul was dealing with that. So Paul is giving you the doctrine of the rapture here. Let's look at another passage. Now this is Matthew 24. This is Jesus teaching about the end. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, one will be left. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day the Lord is coming. So we see in the New Testament, we see Paul talking about the doctrine of the rapture, and we see Jesus in Matthew, and he's doing it in all the Gospels, talking about the rapture. And he's talking about it in such a way there are two people, and one is just going to be taken or just gone, right? Just disappear. All right, let's look at some more stuff. All right, so one is pulled away. It's like, so So the, the concept of the rapture is, you know, Christ comes for the church. The rapture happens to the church. Christ comes for the church and the church is caught up to meet him in the sky. All right, as Paul states in Corinthians. So let's look at the word rapture that, you know, there are claims that are not in the Bible. So the word rapture in the Bible, or at least in the New Testament, is harpazo. Harpazo means to be violently snatched away, to be taken, to be pulled away, to be yanked away with force, with violence, violently, just being bodily taken up and moved. That's what harpazo means. And that is the word that is that is the word used when we talk about rapture harpazo in latin would be rapio which is where we get rapture from so harpazo is there it's all over the bible but it's definitely in the new testament all right but the concept and the doctrine of the rapture is not only in the new testament let's look at the old testament in Genesis 5, 24, there's a long genealogy. And in verse 24, you see, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, or he was not found, or he could not be found, for God took him. If you are reading that from the Septuagint, it will say Enoch walked with God, and he was not found, for God translated him. Right? So in the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Bible, of the Old Testament, done in the 3rd century BC, 3rd to 4th century BC, the word there was harpazo as well. However, we're reading from the Old Testament, which was written in Hebrew. And let's look at the word used for took, where God took Enoch, where God raptured Enoch. What word did they use? The word used was lachak all right now lachak means it's very similar to harpazo it means to take away to snatch away to remove by force but then lachak also means to marry but to marry with the concept or with the idea of to take a wife so what's the relation between to violently snatch away and then to take a wife that does make sense now throughout the bible <clears throat> the old testament is a teaching tool god uses it to teach us certain truths and throughout the bible in the old testament we see god's relationship with his believers with israel framed within the concept of a marriage so 
God is married to Israel. Israel is his wife. When Israel are being rebellious, they are his, you know, adulterous wife, right? Or, you know, they are fornicating. You, see, you constantly see that kind of language. In the New Testament, the church is not the wife. The church is Christ engaged, his bride, his betrothed, right? His fiance. So we constantly see this type of language when it comes to Yahweh and his believers. And as I'm on that point, the church does not replace Israel. All right. So if anyone is teaching that the church is the new Israel or the church replaces Israel, then that's completely incorrect. If the church has something to do, Israel has something to do. If the church replaced Israel, that means God is an oath breaker and a liar. And Yahweh is not an oath breaker and a liar. But back to it, let's look. So, so when it comes to the relationship between God and his followers, it's, it's, it's usually used in the symbology of a marriage, of some type of romantic relationship. So in the Old Testament, it's a husband and a wife, right? God and Israel in the New Testament. It's a fiance, Christ, and the bride who will eventually become the wife. Let's take a look at something else here. So what I want to look at would be ancient Jewish marital customs. Now remember I said God loves to use things and practices, worldly practices, for people to or to teach people things for people to understand things so let's look at the standard jewish marriage practice from the time of you know jesus from second temple um, and first temple judaism so the first thing well before this when the the, the couple are children their parents would arrange the marriage and then when they reach of age, the couple would get engaged and there will be an engagement ceremony. They are not single, but they are not necessarily married. They are not free to marry anyone else. And they getting involved with anyone else is punishable by death. As we saw with Joseph, with the, with the whole scenario with Joseph and Mary when they were engaged and, you know, Joseph found out that she was pregnant. If Joseph moved a, a different way, she could have been killed. It was well in his, within his right to have her killed. All right. So they are not completely married, but they are not single. They are engaged. So there's that, the ceremony. They're engaged. After that, the couple goes their separate ways until the wedding and there is little to no contact between them all right so they get engaged and then there's this period of separation usually it was a year but it could have varied all right they go they do different things getting ready for the final stage of the wedding the bride gets ready to be a wife including making her bridal clothes, sewing, knitting, learning whatever needs to be done if she needs to cook or whatever the case may be. If she needs to learn to cook, I mean, whatever the case may be, but the bride will get ready and do what she has to do. The groom goes home to his father's house and builds an addition, a suite for his new family in his father's house. In the Bible, we see Jesus saying, in my father's house, there are many mansions. That word mansions is a bit of a mistranslation. A better translation is, in my father's house, there are many sweets because the bride sorry not the bride the bridegroom brings his wife 
to his father's house, to a sweet in his father's house. And that bride now becomes a part or a member of the family. That bride essentially becomes his father's daughter. She becomes his relation, his blood relation, unless there is a divorce at some point. So the bride goes, gets her sewing ready, does what she needs to do. The groom goes and builds an addition to his father's house, and he gets ready to bring his new bride into his family and make that woman a member of his family. At some point, not the groom, the groom's father will decide that everything is ready and he will set a date for the wedding, the groom's father. It's like when Jesus said, no one knows when I'm coming except the father because it's the father in Jewish marital customs, ancient Jewish marital customs at least, that sets the date. The father decides when it is ready to get married, when it is the date, when the son is able to bring his bride home. When that father decides the date, the groom then gets his friends and if he's wealthy, his servants, and they are going to go and get the bride, but they will do it unannounced. They're not going to warn the bride that they're coming. They're not going to say, hey, we're coming next week, Tuesday. No, they will go to the bride's house unannounced. When they arrive to the bride's house, and a lot of the time, this is in the wee hours of the morning. Before they reach the bride's house, a little way off, the groom will have a trumpet blown and there, there will be a shout to alert the bride. She may be sleeping, it's the wee hours of the morning, so she could drag on her, you know, get her bridal gown on or whatever the case may be, or get dressed. So there'll be a trumpet and there'll be a shout. Remember the passage we read earlier. Remember the passage from Thessalonians we read earlier. There'll be a shout, there'll be a trumpet. So there'll be a shout, there'll be a trumpet. And then the people who the groom brought, his friends or servants or whatever, they will then run into the house. They'll run into the bride's house. They will bodily pick up the bride and they will take her back bodily, carrying her to the groom's house. At that point, there will be a wedding ceremony. They will, the bride and the groom will consummate the marriage. And that bride is now a part of the family. This is meant to teach us about God's intent. It also teaches us about the rapture. We will be picked up and bodily removed at some point that only the father knows. Should this cause us anxiety? No. Because there is re there, there are rewards for doing what God wants us to do. And God wants all of us to do stuff for him. God wants all of us to share the tr his truth. And there are rewards for various things. There's a reward for just looking out for Christ's return. However, you don't look out, you don't sit down in a field and say, I am doing nothing. I'm waiting for Jesus to come. Come, Lord, come and take me. I'm doing nothing. No, the Bible says, occupy until he comes. What does that mean? Go about your way. Do what you have to do. Try everything in your power to make this world a better place. Make sure, spread the truth of God. Do everything you have to do. Help who you need to help. Teach who you need to teach. Do what you need to do. And when Jesus comes, well, at that point, he'll deal with that. Read some of the parables. There's a parable about 
Um, I should have put it up, but this is this is a bootleg. So there's a there's a parable about you know um, the master of the house giving out talents and coming back and finding the 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 workmen idle doing nothing. That's not what Jesus wants, and that's not what the rapture is about. You busy yourself doing one living your life and two doing the work that God has made you his image to do and when the rapture comes he will deal with that all right you will move on but why the rapture what's the point let's look at see what's the point there is a festival a, a a feast in Israel called Sukkot, right? It's also called the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, everything in the Old Testament, we are taught that everything in the Old Testament is a memorial for something. So Sukkot would be a memorial for when Israel wandered in the, in the, in the wilderness and they lived in tents. All right? But now they're in the promised land, they, lived in, they live in proper houses. So Sukkot was a memorial for the time when God took them through the wilderness and they lived in these flimsy temporary dwellings. Now we are taught in the New Testament that the Old Testament is a memorial for them, but it points to something in the future. And the something in the future for Sukkot, for the tabernacles, is there's a day when we will no longer live in flimsy tents, but we will live in real and proper houses. The, fil the, the flimsy tents or the temporary dwellings I'm talking about is the body. The Bible says that with the rapture, we will be changed. We will be translated. Our frail, flimsy, mortal bodies will be changed to powerful, immortal bodies. And mortality will put on immortality. And the corruptible will put on the incorruptible. The word used, there's a passage in the Bible where they're talking about the angels who sinned, who put aside their station. The word they use is okaterion. It's the same concept. It's the same how you're changing house. You're moving from one house to the other house. So we in the future are going to be raptured and we are going to change houses we are going to move from this temporary flimsy house into a glorified permanent stable strong house a gl our glorified bodies but in the meantime we stay on earth we do what we need to do we do everything we need to do for the kingdom of God to go forward. We share as much truth as we can, especially now where the world is full of lies and deceit. Right? We combat deceit as much as we can, which is why I'm doing this video to combat this nonsense about rapture anxiety and the fact that rapture isn't mentioned in the Bible. That's, that's not the case at all. So hopefully I've done that. All right, so we go forward. So that's it for this video. Um, there are more coming, all right? The next video in, that I'll be doing would be, I'm finishing up on Divine Rebellions Part 2, Mount Hermon. So look out for it. Like and subscribe. God bless you. Thank you.